Um, so I'd like to talk to you about lung cancer as one of the big four cancers um, that you need to cover in the year four oncology topic. I'm Pooja Jen, one of the oncology consultants. So I thought we'd start with basics to put it in context as to why it makes one of your big four. And it is uh, quite a common cancer. It's responsible for 13% of all cancers if we look at the data from 2016 collected by CIUK. Um, despite being responsible only for 13% of all the cancers, the cancer deaths is actually takes a bigger proportion and it's responsible for 21% of those cancer deaths. So that automatically tells you that's not one of those cancers um, that we're good at curing and has a big impact on patients' health. Now, if we translate that to actual numbers, uh, again, these are collated by the Cancer Research UK. Um, and for 2014-2016, we had roughly 47,000 new cases in the year, per year. Um, again, looking at number of deaths that we had in 2016 due to lung cancer, almost 35,000. So incidents and death rates tending to be equal. And the main reason is because this cancer presents at a more advanced stage. We don't have any screening for this. And therefore, you won't be surprised that the outcomes are poor with a 10-year survival of 5%. But this is better and it is slowly improving. And over the last years, it, uh, last five years, it has improved by 3 to 5%. So this is just putting all that data that uh, we discussed a few minutes ago um, in a graph. And what you can see is um, incidence rates um, on the bottom axis is your age um, numbers per year. And also um, it's divided by sex. So the pink is for females cases and blue is for male cases. And as you'd expect, it's a cancer which is more commonly seen in men than women. But the trends are increasing for both men and women um, uh, and it's also a cancer of the elderly population. As you can see, it starts to take off around 60, but the peak is actually uh, around 80, 85. So this is another uh, way of looking at mortality. As I showed to you, it's a cancer with high mortality, mortality higher in male than female. But this easily shows you that um, what we mentioned earlier, that mortality is falling. You can see from the graph that the blue curve is clearly falling. The pink actually seems to be going up uh, and that is linked with uh, lung cancer cases in women uh, going up. Again, looking at survival and this splits it with stage and tries to put it in context. And on this side, you have um, one year survival with respect to stage. And here you have uh, the proportion of cases that actually present with those stages. And you can actually see that these are almost mirror images if you had a mirror here in the sense that survival, as you'd expect, is highest for the earlier stage disease uh, and lowest for stage four. But what we said earlier, majority presented an advanced uh, stage, um, stage four being the commonest presentation followed by stage three. And the other uh, key thing for lung cancer is, unfortunately, it's one of those cancers that is uh, linked with deprivation. And again, you've got two uh, types of data, men and female rates here. But as you can see, the curve is going up from least deprived down at this end to most deprived. So that was a little bit about demographics of lung cancer and what type of patients get it. But now if we look at the biology of lung cancer, um, that's what's depicted on this um, slide. You can see here, the pie chart shows you um, the different histological subtypes, small cell cancer is diminishing, it's responsible for about 15%, so the majority of your cancers come into the, uh, this category, which is the non-small cell lung cancer, but as you can see that they are also of different histology. It's not one cancer, it's quite heterogeneous. Now you may have heard people say that adenocarcinoma is a cancer that you associated with non-smoking. Um, this has just been put up, just interesting really, the proportion of non-smokers in each cancer is depicted uh, by this um, hyphenated line here. And yes, you can see that in adenocarcinoma, there's a bigger proportion of non-smokers, but smoking is the big biggest uh, risk factor for all sorts of lung cancer, pretty much universal for small cell lung cancer. It's very rare to see small cell lung cancer in a non-smoker. And the other thing to point out is this histology in the non-small cell lung cancer has changed predominantly. Previously, squamous cell used to be the commonest histological subtype, but you can see clearly now that it's adenocarcinoma that dominates. And that is really re linked back to smoking habits and changes in cigarettes. 
As fine filters were in, uh, introduced um, in cigarettes, that meant you had finer particles that got deposited in your alveoli, giving you uh, increased risk of adenocarcinoma. So that is why you're seeing adenocarcinoma in smokers here as well. In the midst of all of this, we do not know what e-cigs are going to do to this histology. Are they going to change it? Um, there are various reports saying they cause an alveolitis. Is that going to give us more adenocarcinoma? It's very difficult to say. And as I've already highlighted the other, not risk factor, but, but factor that affects how well you treat these patients is deprivation. So how do we think a lung cancer present? Um, and these are basically the common symptoms that if somebody was to mention to you, you might think of a lung cancer. And as you can see that the top cough and breathlessness are not um, specific at all. A lot of us have cough and breathlessness. A lot of your patients will have cough and breathlessness, especially if they've got COPD. The other symptoms that actually become, uh, that people are going to present with to you that might be more specific for lung cancer, like hemoptysis, pain, weight loss, pain, be it in the chest, in any bone, in abdomen, or neurological symptoms are hallmarks of advanced disease. So as you can see, if you wait for symptoms, you are only going to pick advanced disease. Hemoptysis, you could say, is a sign of an early cancer, but what that tells you is that that cancer is sitting very central if it's going to um, give hemoptysis. So we're probably looking at a T3, T4 lesion. And again, it, even though it may not have spread, the fact that it is so central means that surgery may not be suitable for that kind of cancer. So if we wait for symptoms, we get late cancers. What are the main options for lung cancer that you know of? And these are localized, are listed here. Basically, they are they fall in two groups. You've got local treatments and you've got systemic treatments. So those are treatments that go in your bloodstream. So local treatments, you wouldn't be surprised, include surgery and radiotherapy. Radiotherapy obviously can be curative or just palliative. Systemic therapies, by and large, for lung cancers are palliative or used as an adjunct to the localized therapies. So on their own, they are not curative. And Previously, they used to consist mainly of chemotherapy for lung cancers, but over the years now they have evolved, including immunotherapy and targeted therapy as well. Target therapies tend to be oral treatments. So if we consider how these treatments fit in, we'll take a case and um, this is the person sitting in front of you. And as you can see, they've got some signs and the signs that you can commonly see on this patient are ptosis. Here you can see this eyelid is covering um, the pupil more so than it is on this side. Meiosis, so you can see this is a constricted pupil compared to this one. Anhydrosis, a little bit harder to appreciate on the photos, uh, but possibly your patient may tell you lack of sweating on that side. This person may also have pain in their right arm or some n n um, numbness or tingling. They, if they've left things go for a long period of time, you may actually notice some weakness of the small muscles of the right hand. So what is this telling you? Is this worrying for cancer? It clearly is. These are symptoms of an apical tumor in the right lung, classically called a pancos tumor. So if you send this person for a chest x-ray, and I've got a typical case here of a patient who is 59 year old, the important things that will help you decide how to treat this patient are listed there. A performance status of zero, no comorbidities, and this is their chest x-ray. See here, the chest x-ray obviously does not belong to that patient that you saw the photo of because the abnormality is in the left here. You can see there is an opacity in the left apex, very clearly defined going all the way to the top of the lungs. The other things to pick on this x-ray are the important negatives. So you can see that both lung fields are clear. There is no pleural effusion. You can see the mediastinum is looking fairly normal. So you're picking up clues about this stage when I said, if you can look at the chest x-ray to try and work out the stage. With the limitation that you have not imaged the abdomen, you're thinking I'm probably looking at a localized tumor stuck here at the top of the left lung. The reason performance status is important is it lets you work out how aggressive you can be with your treatment because it explains how well that patient is despite the diagnosis of cancer and what they're fit for. And comorbidities are also important because some of our treatments uh, are contraindicated with certain conditions. So with this 59 year old, very good performance status patients with no other problems, how do we think we're going to treat her? 
What is our intent is the most important thing to decide first. And what are we going to use out of our listed modalities that we've covered before? Chemotherapy, radiotherapy, anything else like surgery? And that will depend on a bit more information than what I've given you. So you now need to stage this patient properly. You need to know whether there's nodal disease, whether there's metastatic disease. If it's truly locally advanced and your patient is fit enough, you can be very aggressive and you can give a combination of all three treatments to try and get local control and slim chance of cure. And as I say, you can you would want to start with chemo radiation because surgery would be hard with it being in the apex. If it's got symptoms of um, brachial plexus, compression, not involvement, you may want an MRI to look at that. So you would start with non-surgical treatment first to downsize it, down bulk it, and then proceed to surgery. But in this case, this lady already had brachial plexus involvement, and so we went for definitive concurrent chemo radiation because we knew it was unlikely we would get surgery in. So that would have been the ideal treatment, but by the time we got all our staging, there was concerns for N3 disease. So the stage here is finally there, and this is crucial in deciding how you're going to treat the lung cancer. You can see T3 tells you where the tumor is sitting, N3 disease for lung cancer means you're getting further away from the tumour. In this case, there were supraclavicular fossa lymph nodes on the left side that were pressing on the brachial plexus. And then there was concern whether she had more advanced disease because, as you can imagine, the nodal change from the uh, supraclavicular fossa is going to go up the neck. So there were concern whether she had some cervical lymph nodes. So this is why we could not go with concurrent chemoradiation and we started with chemotherapy first. Because they didn't have any chem uh, comorbidities, we went for our most aggressive treatment option with cisplatin. However, you can imagine that lung cancer patients may be smokers, and therefore comorbidities like diabetes or ischemic diseases like cardiovascular or peripheral vascular would make you think twice of using uh, cisplatin. She continued with the treatment and really didn't show much response from chemotherapy. And this is why chemotherapy is not curative with lung cancer. The chances of response are about 30%. Unfortunately, her symptoms were not improving. Her pain in the neck was worse. Chest X-ray appeared to be stable, so we had to look into deeper with MR scans. And what we saw was that the cancer was eroding the bone and going into the vertebral bodies. So we know that despite spreading elsewhere, it wasn't responding and it was eroding the spine uh, we had to control her symptoms with palliative radiotherapy and unfortunately her cancer journey was very quick. It was less than a year. So if we consider another case to see how we can manage other lung cancers, this lady, very different to presentation to the um, other case. This was an emergency presentation and unfortunately a lot of lung cancer's first presentation will be through a &E, and we know now that people who present like that don't tend to do that well. It's not as if her symptoms came all of a sudden, which is why she went to A&E. As you can see, she'd been symptomatic with breathlessness, cough, weight loss for three months, but I hadn't thought of mentioning it to anyone. She didn't have any other local symptoms of hemoptysis or pain. So when she turns up with breathlessness, this is the x-ray that you take in A&E. And what you can see here, it's a very different picture to an old, the other x-ray. The pathology is on the left side, but you get an impression of an opacity in the left upper and mid zones you get a bulge. You can see the mediastinum here is bulging. It's not as straight. You can see that the left lung is smaller than the right lung. There's some tenting of the diaphragm. And there's a haze on the top of the air here. So you, this, with a, a PA or an AP will sort of tell you where it sits um, in the supinf direction, but a lateral will help you work out where it is in the anterior posterior direction. And this is a lateral of the left lung. You can see the lower lobe is fine, so the pathology here is sitting in the front of the lungs on the left and it's in the upper lobe. The other thing that you may have noticed or picked up on is this trachea, and you can see it's really occluded here. You cannot see the bifurcation into the left main. So what do you think this patient's symptoms are in A&E apart from breathlessness? And how will you sort of look after her? What will be the next test and how would you treat her? She's come in extreme mix, you would probably get a CT scan, and this picture I've put on in a coronal view um, so that you can try and correlate it to the x-ray. And it's very similar to what you saw on the x-ray. You saw a mass on the x-ray here. You saw bulging of the mediastinum. You saw narrowing of the airways on the x-ray. So apart from breathlessness, what do you think you might be hearing um, when you are talking to this lady or examining her? 
and that would be stridal because you can see this airway is very narrowed. So this patient would be stridulous and that's an emergency. So how will you treat her straight away? Well, you've got to look after that airway. So you'll get her on high flow oxygen, but to take the pressure off, you'll give her steroids. So we're still not managing what we think is a cancer here, but we're trying to get on top of her symptoms. And who would you ask for help in managing this patient next? So you'd want the respiratory team down there to help you with airway management and to try and stabilize the patient. Hopefully, the respiratory dream will proceed to a bronchoscopy because oncology is not going to be helpful until we know exactly what type of cancer we're dealing with. And this is what the pathology sees in under the microscope. And what you see here is a classical small cell lung cancer. And the reason it is a classical small cell lung cancer is the cancer cells are small. You can see lots of mitoses. The nuclei um, are open. There's lots of divisions going on. There's not a lot of cytoplasm going on there. And you can see dense neurosecretory granules. So small purple cells are worrying for small cell lung cancer. And that is what this is. So now that you've got the diagnosis, you would talk to your oncology colleagues. And what do you think we would do? Before that, there are other things to uh, just bring up on uh, small cell lung cancer. And small cell lung cancer is one of the cancers that is associated with paraneoplastic syndrome. So it does not have to present with chest symptoms, but can present with symptoms as a result of any of these syndromes, commonly SIADH or syndrome of inappropriate ADH production, which gives hyponatremia. But other ones that have been associated with are ectopic ACTH production, and also Eaton-Lambert syndrome, and Eaton-Lambert syndrome is similar to myasthenia, but obviously it's not myasthenia gravis, it is because of presence of paraneoplastic antibodies in a small cell lung cancer. So coming back to treatment, what do you think is the mainstay of small cell lung cancer? You'd still got chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery in your arms. And the first thing to say is surgery very rarely plays a role in small cell lung cancer. And the reason is because this cancer has a very fast doubling time. And so you need to get on with systemic treatment and chemotherapy is the mainstay. Depending on how people respond, how well they are, where the cancer is, radiotherapy is also an integral part of treatment, but you generally tend to start with chemotherapy first. So this patient was transferred across to oncology and because they were an extremist, had their first cycle of chemotherapy as an inpatient. And this lung cancer is probably the only cancer that we would give chemotherapy as an inpatient. Chemotherapy as an inpatient has high mortality, morbidity, and it's really a test of principle. If we can get them out after one cycle of chemotherapy, that's a good sign. And that's what happened to this lady. We were able to get her out, finish the chemotherapy, and then we were able to give her radiotherapy to the chest and the brain. And you might ask me why we were doing the brain in somebody who doesn't have metastatic disease. And that is because small cell lung cancer have a pred predominance of going into brain as the first site of relapse. And that can obviously debilitate patients a lot. And what we usually find is that that is usually the end of the line for them. And so if we give radiotherapy upfront in patients that respond to treatment, we can reduce the risk of brain metastases by 50 percent. We can improve their survival by three to five percent. And so this is one of the rare cancers where we'd give radiotherapy to the brain apart from in some childhood cancers. And this is the response. So unlike non-small cell chemo uh, chemotherapy, which I said had a response rate of 30 percent, small cell lung cancers respond very well to chemotherapy. This uh, was the x-ray post cycle one. And if you may remember, you had quite a big mass um, at presentation in the upper zone and you had the bulge on the mediastinum. Uh, and if you can in your own time go back to that picture, you will clearly see the difference. And this x-ray was what had happened to her lungs and her cancer after four cycles. So the response rate to small cell chemotherapy is about 70 to 80%. But unfortunately, because of the fast doubling time, the responses are not long lived. And that is why we would try and give radiotherapy to consolidate on that. And that's exactly what she had. So at presentation, she also had N3 disease. In her case, the N3 was not the neck. It was the nodes on the right side of the mediastinum, which is what you saw on the chest X-ray. And she completed everything. And you can see her cancer journey for somebody with small cell has been curative because she presented in March and I actually discharged her last year. The reason I picked her is basically to show twofold that uh, what you are taught 
doesn't always come true in life. You've got to assess each case on its merits and see how far you can get. And sometimes you get surprises like curing a small cell lung cancer. The other reason to bring this case is to show the toxicity of the cranial irradiation. So yes, she didn't develop any brain metastases, but she had significant memory impairment to the effect that the family were, unfortunately, by the time I discharged, concerned whether she was safe enough as she would sometimes turn the gas on and forget about it. And unfortunately, it's because our radiotherapy is very crude for the brain. It treats the whole brain. Brain controls a lot of high, um, higher functions and short term memory loss is a common side effect that we see. If we can spare the hippocampus in the brain, then we will see less of this toxicity. So covering, I've covered both small cell and non-small cell lung cancers. Hopefully I've explained the differences between the two to you and thought I'd focus on telling you what is actually changing in lung cancer and what has changed. So the current, the biggest thing that's changing in lung cancer is that we are bringing screening in. There are now multiple studies internationally that are show, showing that you can change the stage at which cancer patients present if you can do screening, which is not surprising because you're going for a asymptomatic patients, but obviously screening within the NHS has to be cost effective. So one of our respiratory colleagues have actually started a trial in Yorkshire and the reason they got this grant was because unlike the national picture where lung cancer is the third most common cancer, in Yorkshire it is the commonest cancer. Also Yorkshire has one of the highest rates of smoking in England and unfortunately also the highest deprived population. So hopefully screening, we will pick up early cancers and we'd be able to treat them with more curative intent. Now we haven't talked about our local treatments much. And as I said, these are surgery and radiotherapy. You can imagine the patients with lung cancer unfortunately have a lot of comorbidities and surgery only forms part of treatment in about 15% of our lung cancer patients. Majority get radiotherapy. We've also had advances in radiotherapy, which have been largely dependent on technological advances, computing speed. But now early stage lung cancers with radiotherapy can have similar local control rates than with surgery. There's a lot of data here in these graphs. They're quite tiny. So I'll just take you through side by side. First of all, what you see here is a radiotherapy plan. This person's got a small cancer sitting here. You can see a color wash map here and what you see are the higher doses of radiotherapy being closer to the reds and then cooling off going to the blue. So the whole aim of radiotherapy is to hit the cancer but spare the organs at risk. For lungs they would be the spinal cord, they'll be your central mediastinal structure, they'll be the bones. The set of graphs you see here is historical data on what's happened to lung cancer on the y-axis for all of these graphs of survival and on the x-axis is time. And the blue, red and green are different cohorts with the blue representing lung cancer cases diagnosed between 2001 and 2003, red 2004 and 6 and green 7 and 8. And A is all comers. So regardless of treatment mortality, what's happened to lung cancer over time? And as you can see, the outcomes are improving, which is good. What you see here is what's happened to lung cancer survival with surgery as the mainstay treatment mortality. So that's your box B. And you can see a clear jump between blue and red, but not such a big jump between red and green lines. And the reason you see a jump between blue and red is because we're now introduced PET scans in that time between 2001 and three and four and six. And so you're actually staging your patients accurately. You're taking the right patients to surgery. So you've not got metas uh, hidden metastatic disease in there. But surgical trends, not much different with um, between 2004, 6 and 7, 9. What you see here in block D is all the lung cancer patients that unfortunately didn't get treatment. And as you can see, all the three lines are overlapping. So this survival improvement that you see in A is not because our general population of lung cancer is living longer. If you don't treat them, they still do bad regardless of when they were diagnosed. What you see in C is what, hap what has happened to the patients that have been treated with radiotherapy. And as you can see, there's a clear consistent split between blue, red and green. And so one can infer that changes in radiotherapy introduced between 2004-6 to 2007-9 have actually pushed the survival. 
and the change that came in was basically being able to deliver very high doses of radiotherapy to the tumours and sparing the organs at risk as best as we can. And this means that the treatment can be delivered in very short t- period of time, over three, five and eight treatments. You can treat patients who are not very well, so up to PS3, and you can um, treat them over a shorter period of time without much toxicity so more patients are accepting of the treatment and therefore getting cured. So we've focused uh, so far on histology very broadly in terms of small cell and non-small cell but there have been advances in non-small cell histology and because of being able to analyze the genome of the lung cancer we can look further and what this slide shows you is that there is a difference between squamous cell cancers genomes and adenocarcinoma. And what it's showing is the crucial driver or oncogenic pathways that are expressed in squamous cell cancer. And you can see they're very different to adenocarcinomas. So in adenocarcinoma, we feel that there are certain mutations that we can target. You remember I mentioned targeted therapy right at the beginning of the lecture. And that is um, predominantly used to be restricted to two sets. ALK, uh, which stood for anaplastic lymphokinase translocation and EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor mutations. But also we have now got ROS1 and other things. So drugs are coming specifically to target these pathways. What that means is that um, you can treat the cancer uh, more in an individualized, personalized sense. But you can see the number and the frequency where we see these mutations. And unfortunately, they are not the common Uh, lung cancers, largely in our population in Yorkshire, we find oncogenic driven tumours are less than 10%. But that means they can respond to oral treatments we have. The other big thing that has come over the last few years is immunotherapy. And again, I mentioned that at the start of the lecture, and I'm not going to go into details of where we use it in lung cancer, but basically talk about principle of the immunotherapy. And as you can see, this is a cartoon diagram telling you the interaction between a tumor cells and your immune T cells. And obviously in the interest of your tumor cells to grow, they want to switch off the immune system and they do so by binding to the T cells by the receptor pathways PD-1 and PDL one So the immunotherapies are coming and blocking this attachment of tumor cells and T cells so that the tumor cells are not able to switch the immune system off. So in time, your immune system can recognize the tumor cells and do the job it does normally against infections, mount a response and kill the cancer cells. So this is slightly different to chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is just going and attacking all cells that are dividing. It's not discriminatory. And therefore, you find that chemotherapy, apart from killing cancer cells, kills your bone marrow, which gives you the toxicities of treatment like neutropenic sepsis, thrombocytopenia, anemia. It affects your gut lining, so it gives you the toxicity of mucositis, diarrhea, nausea, skin rashes, hair. So you can see all the normal organs that are dividing get affected by chemotherapy. Immunotherapy, because of the way it acts, does not have the traditional chemotherapy side effects. Unfortunately, the toxicity of immunotherapy is more an autoimmune effect, which again, you can probably understand once you've looked at this diagram, because what you're doing is activating your immune system and then along with it attacking your cancer cells, if unfortunately it attacks one of the normal organs in the body, that's where you get your toxicity from. One of the common side effects of immunotherapy is thyroid. Um, imbalance, it has a predilection for going and attack, attacking thyroid cells. But the inflammation can be seen in any organs, in lungs, in livers, in heart. Immunotherapy in lung cancer is used now in, across the range. It's used in stage four disease on its own, along with chemotherapy. It's coming forward into stage three to be used after maintenance treatment. And there are trials going to try and use an adjuvant and neoadjuvant setting. And potentially what we're seeing is that we can get some long-term survivals, even in stage four disease. So this would be the biggest game changer moving forward for lung cancers. So I'd like to finish to say that lung cancer, I hope I've shown you, is a very heterogeneous disease. Even non-small cell lung cancer is not one disease. To be able to treat lung cancer, we have to move away from the nihilism. We have to get tissue because otherwise we cannot treat them appropriately and we cannot make them live longer. The poor survival is linked to the late presentation 
and therefore hopefully screening, especially if it gets established nationally, will help, especially if focused in the high-risk population. But as ever with lung cancer, it is very difficult to reach this high-risk population as they're hard to engage. The oncogenic tumours, which I've shown with the targeted therapies, are only a small proportion of the lung cancer patients, but they do very well and they have lots of treatment options that are different to chemotherapy. So it's important, again, to identify them, going back to the need for taking tissue. The immunotherapy drugs are going to open up significant advances in lung cancer. But pulling back, you have two treatment options, systemic, which is largely palliative, neoadjuvant or adjuvant, and your curative treatments remain local treatments, surgery and radiotherapy. And as you go up the stage ladder towards stage two and three, you need to use all your treatment modalities together to try and achieve cure. Thank you.